Hello and welcome to Tala Talks NICU. I'm Dr. Tala and on this channel we normally break down neonatal concepts and make them really easy to understand. This week we're doing something a little bit different and it kind of feels really YouTube-y, but we're doing a collaboration with Alexis Nicole who runs the YouTube channel The Nurse Nook. So both of us have listed out 10 things that you should know if you are working in the NICU. Alexis Nicole has been working in the NICU as a NICU nurse for several years now and is currently in NNP school. And her channel, The Nurse Nook, apart from being absolutely beautiful like her, is a very honest account of what's actually going on in the NICU, what's going on in her life and with her studies. So highly recommend. And here is a clip of her video of 10 important facts that you need to know in the NICU. We work in touch times. Touch time essentially is clustering your care. So in the neonatal ICU, majority of our patients are premature. So all of our patients are technically supposed to still be in their mother's womb. So we try to simulate the experience that the baby would be having in their mother's womb. We do that by putting babies in isolates. We keep it very nice and warm. And then we typically cover the isolates with blankets or um, thick sheets to kind of make a nice, dark, quiet environment. Right, let's start with our list. What you should know if you ever step into the NICU. And the first thing that you should know is that you should always be nice. Yep, that's it. Be as nice as you can to everyone around you. And there are studies that I'm gonna talk about in a second, which show just how important this is in neonatal care. We all get it. It's a really high intensity environment most of the time. And some hospitals just have like a culture of rudeness embedded within them. Like, you know, the older nurses may think or the older doctors may think, oh, I was treated like this, so I can continue that. Or that whole kind of like, eat the young mentality or the hazing that happens. So yes, there can be a lot of rudeness that you're stepping into. There is so much evidence about why this is not good. Obviously, it would make all of our own days in the NICU more miserable and we all wouldn't enjoy work as much and it would majorly contribute to burnout, but also it's been shown to directly affect patient care. A couple of brilliantly done randomized studies were done in Israel a few years ago that showed directly that rudeness on medical teams, whether it's by somebody in the medical team or whether it's by a family member, will directly worsen the medical care that the infant is receiving. So in one study, they set up simulations where a group of doctors and nurses had to take care of a simulated patient with necrotizing enterocolitis. That baby slowly got worse, ended up becoming hypotensive, and even ended up with a infiltrate from the PICC line causing a cardiac tamponade. So different groups were randomized, and one of the groups just received the instructions from the simulation. The other group, in addition to receiving the instructions about the simulation, also received very negative or rude comments from the man running the simulation who was an American man deemed to be an expert. So again, this study was done in Israel. So this American expert was saying things like, the standard of care in Israel isn't up to American standards, and I'm paraphrasing here, or you wouldn't last a week in an American unit, or I hope I don't get sick, on my visit to Israel. And lo and behold, they found that the group that was exposed to the rude comments did significantly worse in just about every way. In the diagnosis, in asking for help, in communication, in procedures, in lab tests that they wanted, really just about every way. How crazy is that? Because some random man that nobody even knew before the simulation started said a couple of rude things, the entire team performed significantly worse. The same research group, Dr. Riskin et al, set up a similar study, but this time there were rude comments coming from the families. And again, when the teams were exposed to rude comments from the families, they did significantly worse in their diagnosis and just their practical management of simulated cases. Obviously, we don't have as much control over this, except for just remember that parents are a lot more likely to be rude when they don't feel like they've been treated appropriately. So words do really, really matter. Even those throwaway comments that you're making as you're leaving the unit for the day. 
in the end, we're all kind of like kids, right? We all just remember all the bad things and forget any positive thing that we've been told. Our second point is about the greatness of caffeine in the unit. So anybody that's watched this channel at all for a little while will know about my bias towards caffeine, mostly because I personally love coffee so much. But honestly, it's also one of the best studied drugs in the NICU. So as you all know, caffeine has been shown and we use it all the time to decrease apnea of prematurity. And you'll all know this if you watch the BPD lectures, but caffeine also decreases the incidence of BPD or the need for oxygen at 36 weeks corrected gestational age. This was shown in a beautiful randomized study that was published in the New England Journal in 2006. Now, what's even better, or kind of better than that, is that those infants in the study have been followed up for a really long time as they got older. And what's been shown is that every age that they were studied, generally the infants that received caffeine, if anything, had better developmental outcomes. The effects dropped off as the kids got older, but even at 11 years, they showed that the kids that had received the caffeine in prematurity had improved visuomotor skills. So things like writing, building with blocks, drawing, or even catching a ball. The infants that received caffeine also had improved visuospatial skills. So things like buttoning up a shirt or making your bed or like putting together Ikea furniture. And the kids exposed to caffeine also had improved visuoperceptual abilities. So things like picking out the blue pencils from a bag of different colored pencils or putting together a jigsaw puzzle. So lots of, if you think about it, really useful life skills were better in the group that had received caffeine versus in the infants that hadn't. There was no effect on intelligence, attention, or behavior. So really we have lots of evidence that caffeine is probably a really good thing, which is why we give it to really all babies who are less than 30 weeks at birth in the NICU, and we'll give it to older premature babies as well if they look like they need it. And we give it to everybody that works in the NICU as well. As part of a role I had in a previous practice I worked for, we had this amazing book club where we'd study these medical books that could help us in the hospital. And one of them was this one. If Disney ran your hospital, nine and a half things you would do differently. Fred Lee, the author, worked both at Disney as well as high up in hospital administration. And basically the book is just about how you should implement strategies that Disney uses to try to make sure that patients as well as employees are happier. Because with happier employees, generally the patients are happier as well and do better. When I read the book, I was kind of like, do we really need to teach people this stuff? But as you all realize, everything goes great when you're not stressed. It's when you're stressed that things really start falling apart. And we really are stressed a lot of the time, whether it's an ethically nebulous situation going on, or whether a 23-weeker is born half an hour before shift change, or whether there's a combative parent, or you're trying to send a NICU baby home from the NICU that hasn't had a hearing screen done yet, and the hearing screener is like trapped in newborn nursery with like 30 billion hearing screens to do. There's lots of stressful situations going on. So Fred Lee really emphasizes that you're not just getting a job, you're actually joining a culture when you're in the NICU, just like in Disney World, and that we should all work together as a team with the sole goals of taking great care of the patient and actually caring about the patient together as a team. In building a great team, he mentioned things like always addressing your coworkers by their names, which is really very easy in the hospital because we all wear the name badges. And if you see anybody as you're walking down a corridor, then smile at them. And of course, being as compassionate as you can to each other as well as the families. And he talked a lot about that the only way that people generally will know that you're showing compassion is if you actually verbalize it. So you actually have to say, can I help you do that? I will take care of your patient while you go to the bathroom or you go and eat lunch 
All of these things are very, very important in actually building a team. In fact, one of the chapters of the book is actually called Make Courtesy More Important Than Efficiency. And that really sums up a lot, doesn't it, in the NICU? If we all kept our heads down, rounded on the patients, went back to our cubicles, wrote the TPN, had a, as little conversation with anybody else unless it directly pertained to the patient, then it really wouldn't be a good environment to build up relationships, which, as we keep saying, are so important for patient care. So sometimes you have to forego efficiency so that you can have meaningful conversations with your co-workers as well as the families. Obviously, there's a time and a place for that. If you are admitting 30-week twins that both have severe high drops, then all you're thinking about at that point is efficiency. There are loads more interesting studies and observations in this book, so we've linked to it below if anybody's interested in reading more. The fourth point is how obsessed with sepsis we are in the unit. And if you've already been working in the NICU, then you've probably already realized this. Infants, especially premature infants, have a really weak immune system. In fact, just about every aspect of their immune system is weaker than kids or adults. So their barriers to the outside world, so the skin, the GI tract, the lungs, are all much thinner than with older kids and adults. So just think of the really gelatinous skin in like a 23 or a 24 weaker. It would be so easy for bacteria or any bugs to get through that. So the barrier systems are actually part of the innate immunity. So innate immunity is immunity that everybody has. It's not like specialized. So things like the barriers to the outside world, as well as the enzymes and the secretions that the baby produces, as well as like the phagocytic cells, the little Pac-Man cells that can eat the bacteria or whatever. These are all weaker in preemie babies. As you can probably imagine, the developmental immunity, so the baby's ability to make specific antibodies against specific organisms, is going to be a lot weaker. So because of this, two things can happen. The first thing is, is that babies can get an infection really, really easily. And the second thing is, is if they do get an infection, it can spread throughout their entire bodies and become extremely dangerous and maybe kill them in a very short period of time. We definitely have to make sure that the infants are protected as well as possible from infections. As you all know, one of the most important things is making sure that our hands are clean, that we're always washing our hands or using an alcohol-based rub. In fact, a recent Cochrane review tried to find out which method of cleaning your hands would be better, and they didn't really conclude which way is better, just that it's very important that you clean your hands. Gloves can help if the hands have been washed first. Just putting on gloves if your hands aren't washed is not at all helpful. And then remember that germs can live under artificial nails or under jewelry. So make sure that when you're in the unit that you have absolutely nothing below the elbows. I just want to point out that as I'm filming this, I'm not on service. So yes, I am wearing rings and stuff below my elbows. Every few years, there's an outbreak of a specific bug in the NICU. And very often, the carrier of that bug is normally traced back to one of the people that actually works in the NICU. So as you're examining or taking care of any patient, just assume that you could be the carrier of some resistant bug. The other obviously important thing that we have to think about is that if a baby does start acting sick, then you have to act on that fast. So send the cultures and start the antibiotics if you are concerned. That really could be life-changing. The fifth point is the ability to answer the most commonly asked question by the parents in the NICU, which is, when can my baby go home? Generally, before I start on my spiel, I'll tell them roughly around the due date. In babies that have older gestational ages, then that can be a couple of weeks before the due date. And in the micro preemies, it can be several weeks after the due date. But kind of the due date is a good rough guide. But more importantly, I'll add that there really isn't a gestational age a baby has to be to be able to go home. They just have to be able to do everything in a safe way that a full-term baby can do. So these are the things that a baby that's being discharged should be able to do. So A, he has to be able to maintain his temperature in an open crib. Generally, babies need one more layer than what you're wearing. So they have to be able to maintain their temperature. And for example, just like a little onesie and maybe pajamas on top of that, they can't have like eight sheepskin blankets and hats and whatever else on top of them to maintain their temperature. B, 
they have to be able to feed in a safe way. So not having Brady's and DSATs and everything whilst they're feeding. This may end up being with a gastric tube for them to go home on. C, they have to feed enough to show sufficient weight gain, especially if they are in an open crib. Remember, when a baby is in an open crib, they have to use a little bit more energy to stay warm. So if they're using all their energy to stay warm, they might not be gaining weight. So we have to show that in an open crib, with a baby eating that set volume, the baby is gaining weight. D, they have to not be having any events. So no apneas, no Brady's, no DSATs. We'll do a whole separate video on this, but generally it's a lot more concerning if a baby has an event when they're actually sleeping or it lasts longer than 20 seconds or it involves color change or needs stimulation. So somebody needs to like stimulate the baby to get the baby out of the event. And depending on your unit's policy, you might need five to seven event free days before the baby is able to go home. E, obviously the baby has to be able to breathe in a safe way with adequate oxygenation, so getting the oxygen in, and adequate ventilation, so getting the carbon dioxide out. This may mean that the baby does need to go home on oxygen or sometimes even with a trach on a vent. F, pass the car seat test. So if a baby was born small or premature, we have to show that they are stable and safe sitting in a car seat. So basically what that involves is putting them in a car seat on a monitor for 90 minutes and making sure that their neck has enough strength to keep their chin up. Sometimes the chin can kind of drop forward and block the airway and that will cause apneas, Brady's and DSAT. Generally, the smallest car seats that are made, and there are a few exceptions, are made for infants that are four pounds or more, which is about 1800 grams. So many units don't let babies go home until they are at least four pounds. See, the caretakers of the baby have to show their ability to be able to take care of the baby at home. Obviously, if there's lots of complicated equipment, then they have to be trained with that and they have to show their proficiency. Sometimes, even if a baby is on no extra equipment, it's just nice for the parents to be able to room in for a night or two to do all the cares for the baby before they transition home. H, and this one's a bit obvious, the baby has to be over whatever brought them into the unit in the first place, whether it was hypoglycemia or rule out syphilis or sepsis or pneumonia or whatever else, they have to be completely treated from that by the time that they go home. So that's pretty much what I always tell parents when they are asking me when their kids can go home. The sixth point is the importance of mother's milk. Look, we all know how important mother's milk is in premature babies. It really is one of the best medications that we can give babies. It greatly reduces the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis, and it probably has a really positive effect on a bunch of other bad diagnoses, like ROP, late onset sepsis, and BPD. So if mothers aren't able to produce any milk or just insufficient amounts of milk, then many hospitals actually have donor, basically pasteurized milk for premature infants. In term babies, breast milk is also considered beneficial. And the American Academy of Pediatrics recently updated their policy statement, kind of listing all the different ways why breastfeeding is so good for babies. And they showed some data in this policy statement that breastfeeding infants decreases the risk of SIDS, of asthma, eczema, even childhood obesity by about 10 to 40%. And you can see the reference below. And so really their conclusions are is that we should really encourage this in mothers and really try to help and support them in any way possible. However, I do really want to add this. Remember that the health and development of an infant is going to depend on the health of the entire family unit. And sometimes breastfeeding just doesn't work for the mother, whether she doesn't produce milk, whether she has lots of other babies and responsibilities that it can't work. So adding insane amounts of pressure to mothers to breastfeed when it's just not working is not good at all for the health of the family or of the infant. So yes, in term babies, breastfed is best if it's working out for the family, otherwise fed is best. It is very important that the baby gets the calories and the nutrition that he needs. The seventh point is the importance of standardizing everything that we do. Obviously, all patients are slightly different, 
but loads of studies have shown the importance of standardized care in patient outcomes. For example, in neonates with neonatal abstinence syndrome, it's been shown that standardized care, so having a set plan with how you're going to treat these babies, will decrease the length of hospitalization for all the babies. Other studies have shown that if everyone in the unit advances the feeds at the same rate, so hopefully following your unit feeding protocol, then there is a reduced incidence of neck. What's interesting is, is it doesn't really matter what that rate is. You could go up by 20 ml per kilo per day, by 30 ml per kilo per day, do four days of trophic feeds. Whatever you're doing, as long as everybody does the same thing, there is a decreased incidence of neck. And there are so many examples of this in the adult world of medicine as well. The adults will get off ventilators much quicker if there is a weaning protocol in place. They will get their first dose of antibiotics much faster if there's a sepsis protocol in place. Generally, standardizing practices greatly improves efficiency because we're all doing exactly the same thing and we're all used to doing the same thing. Therefore, it also saves time, it saves costs, and it reduces waste. It also results in consistent outcomes, and so we can actually study it in an effective way. For example, if everybody was randomly, haphazardly changing the pick line dressings on different days with different techniques, with different amounts of sterility, then we really wouldn't be able to say in what way that's affecting the CLABSI rate in the NICU. It's very important that we all do the same thing so we have a reasonable result when it does happen. But most importantly, standardizing everything improves patient safety as well as patient outcomes. So learn what is happening inside your unit. Don't be one of those people that's like, oh, in Iowa, we used to do this. And in Denver, we used to do this. You should absorb the culture of your unit. Three things I wanna add. The first one is, Obviously, if you think that in your U unit, they are practicing very, very aged medicine, then there are certain ways that you could introduce a newer way of doing things. It doesn't have to be like, I'm not doing that, you're so far behind, everything can be done subtly. The second thing, as I've already said, is we're all human, patients are human. So sometimes they're ready to do something or they're telling you st something before you're actually ready. So even if you weren't ready to extubate the baby on that day, because generally your unit extubates at this sort of levels and the baby pulls out the ET tube, at least try them on non-invasive support. And the third thing, and this is honestly probably one of the most important things, when we're all consistent with our plans and processes, it's a lot more easy to be consistent with the parent. And you've all seen this, parents getting really upset because we're all telling them slightly different things. In the worst case scenario, the parents will kind of start playing us off against each other. Like, oh, Dr. P said this, so why are you possibly telling me that this baby isn't anywhere close to stopping the antibiotics or whatever? Obviously, this really reduces trust in the NICU team, as well as the inclusion of the family in medical decisions. So this is really not somewhere where any of us want to get to. Consistency is key. Which brings me to point number eight, which is that this is the absolute lowest point in a parent's life. So not only are they mourning the loss of their full-term healthy baby, but there is also an unfathomable amount of stress going on in their lives. They're exhausted, they're terrified, they probably have a lot of guilt, whether it's because they had that cup of coffee or they went for a run, and really it's always misplaced guilt. They might also be extremely stressed financially. Maybe they can't get to the unit as often as they want to because they have jobs that they have to go to or because they don't have transport or because they don't have money for gas for their car. So yes, parents will get angry and sad and scared and just about every single emotion that a human can go through. There is a huge body of evidence about the depression and the anxiety and the PTSD that NICU parents go through. So just realize that every single person that works in the NICU has a role to play in making the parents' lives better. It's important to involve them in conversations and care plans about their babies. 
and just generally practicing family-centered care allows the parents to actually make decisions and therefore be parents instead of just bystanders. Just give them positive reinforcement whenever you can. So give them positive reinforcement when they bring a little bit of breast milk into the unit or when they're participating in kangaroo care. Check in on them to see how the rest of their lives are going, whether they're sleeping and eating and who's helping them at home and how they're getting to the hospital and how they're feeling. These very short conversations can really mean the world to parents. So really just Tiny changes in our behavior can completely alter the course, the NICU course for these families. And again, this kind of goes back to the courtesy above efficiency sometimes in the NICU. The ninth point is the importance of noise levels in the NICU. And I'll talk about this in a bit, but I know that that's something that I have to work on. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that the sound level in the NICU should not exceed 45 decibels. Unfortunately, it very often does. And hearing impairment is diagnosed in between 2 to 10% of preterm infants versus 0.1% of the general population. Anybody that's taking care of a preemie baby or a PPHN baby, you'll know that loud noises can really cause events, apneas, Brady's, DSATs. Even if they're not actively having an event, then overall their heart rate or their respiratory rate may go up. If this happens consistently, then obviously this is going to burn a lot more oxygen and a lot more energy that the babies could be using to healing and growing. It's often suggested that lowering the ambient noise in the NICU can really help with the growth and development and reduce adverse outcomes for these infants. So how loud is 45 decibels? So total silence obviously is zero decibels. Whispering to somebody is 15 decibels. The sound that you would hear just kind of in a library is about 45 decibels. And if you're having a normal conversation with somebody, it is 60 decibels. So basically, if you're having a normal conversation with somebody next to a baby in an open crib, then it's too loud for the baby. One study found that if a baby is inside an incubator, then it does reduce the overall noise level by between five to 10 decibels. So there is a little bit of an advantage there. But remember, it's not just the conversations, it's also the surgery happening in the next bed over or the x-ray machine kind of being wheeled in or the air conditioning unit like going at like full blast. All of these add to that constant noise that the babies are being exposed to. Many units have like those traffic lights where the red light will go on if the ambient noise level is too high. And this really is a good thing. It's a good thing for the babies and it probably also increases productivity amongst the staff. And I will say that this is not easy. As anyone who's worked with me or Ariana knows, we love to enjoy our days in the NICU. I love chatting with people. I love chatting with parents. I will speak to babies. I love chatting with just about everybody else that walks into the NICU. So unless you're constantly thinking about the noise level, it can escalate and get out of hand really, really quickly. I know that this is something that I have to work in, but the unit itself as a whole should constantly be thinking of ways to decrease the ambient noise level. Number 10, the last point that I want to make is that the less that we do for the babies, the better it is for the babies. And this is really where we've been going for the last few decades. So the less respiratory support that we can give, the less oxygen that we can give, the less labs that we do, the less transfusions that we give, the fewer the medications that we give, really the less invasively that we can do everything and reduce all this like noxious stimuli, the better it is for the baby. And the hope is, is that the less that we do for babies, then the higher chance that they'll just be able to heal and grow in peace. What we're really trying to do for premature babies is basically to recreate the uterine environment. So we want the babies to feel warm. We put them in this kind of humid environment. We want them to feel safe and secure and loved. And we want to prevent as much noxious stimuli from affecting them as possible. Even for term babies, we've kind of been realizing that the less that we put on their bodies, the better. So we don't want to slather them with creams and everything else. They have their own very good natural secretions that we don't want to ruin. Even the umbilical cord, we just kind of let that dry now instead of put the triple dye or whatever on it that we used to do consistently. So even in term babies, less is generally considered more. Or as everybody likes to say in medicine, don't just do something, stand there. 
Okay, that was it. I hope you learned something from those 10 points. If you're interested in neonatal content, then please subscribe to this channel and like this video while you're here, if you got this far. And now go over and watch the other 10 points that you need to know in the NICU at the Nurse Nook. Thank you so much for being here.